Thank you very, very much. I appreciate all of you being here. And it's just wonderful to see uh, Dr. Watts says, I just work here. He's our associate provost here <laughs> at Delhi University. So I want to thank him for being here. And he hasn't been here very long, but he has been very, very encouraging of my administration and what I'm trying to do in the communication department. So Dr. Watts, thank you very, very much for being here and being so gracious. I want to thank, of course, uh, my family. Uh, and I'll say this before I start. I want my loving husband to stand up, if you will. <laughs> sister is here. Uh, she's Alpha, and I'm Omega. So I <laughs> and uh, a chip off the old block, I, I normally call him. He's my nephew, but Dr. Watts, he's also going into the area of communication, and he is a teacher at St. Andrews. Ricky, please stand. <laughs> You know, I, I often talk in my classes about someone, and she doesn't know and won't know until tonight that I'm always speaking about her and talking about some things that we did when we were coming up as I'm talking about a theory in communication. But finally, she's here to actually let all my students see who this person is, and that's my dearest and best friend. <laughs> And I have so many former students who are here. And I even have a former student uh, who texts me, his wife just had a baby uh, day before yesterday, and he's trying to come. And I'm saying, please, you need to be <laughs> Kayla, <laughs> Parker, Jackson. But uh, uh, in spirit, uh, he is here. And all of the cameras that you see, and all of these people that you see are all students of mine. And I'm so pleased to see my church here. That makes me feel good that Faith Presbyterian Church is here and uh, very, very uh, supportive. And uh, I hope I do well. I hope my Sunday school teacher is pleased with my performance. <laughs> they will get that joke. <laughs> so I hope he is. I would like to thank my adjunct faculty, and I want them to stand. individuals mean to me because when I need to vent and when I need things, yes, Dr. Watts, I do vent from time to time, <laughs> but these people listen and they are very, very helpful and uh, I just don't know what I would do without them uh, if they were really and truly not here. And uh, last but not least, I'd also like to thank the Bell Haven University family and I would be remiss, they are members of my sorority here. And I would like for them to stand Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And, and, and I have to say, I have uh, one, one fraternity brother here. Raise your hand. <laughs> I'm sorry, dear. Oh, maybe it's not <laughs> Okay. The title of what we'll be talking about tonight is uh, Breaking News. And you see where I say it's a Christian journalist perspective. So we're going to, can you hear me now? Can you hear? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about breaking news, and we're going to talk about what it really means. It is newly received information about an event that is currently ongoing or that is currently developing. I want to talk about this is because there are so many people here that you get your breaking news on this phone, don't you? You get your breaking news on your computer. You get your breaking news on a lot of different platforms. And uh, 
I wanted to talk about that because, you know, it's changed the way we get information. And this is what we talk to the students about. Uh, here at Bell Haven, we look at everything we do from a Christian standpoint. And I'll be discussing what my Christian walk is as it relates to breaking news. All right, how to cover breaking news with skill and heart. Just imagine, you're in the middle of a wreck on Highway 55. In fact, we had one today, didn't we? Out in South Jackson. And you're in the middle there, and you've got to figure out a way. I've got fatalities on one side of me. You know, I've got people that are hurt on another side of me. And I've got to bring this information to where? To the general public. I've got to bring this information with sensitivity. I've got to bring this information with, with care and with a heart. And that takes special kind of people. I know we make it look easy as people from the media, but it is a very, very difficult job to do. And uh, I know some of the faculty members, especially in communication, can attest to the fact that it is difficult to do that. The Radio uh, Television Digital News Association suggests the following standards be applied to covering breaking news and those events. Uh, they determine your criteria for running special reports, including news crawls. Now, a news crawl is what you see that's crawling on your television screen. And the decisions that you make. Uh, really and truly, there are a lot of decisions that have to be made as you cover news. And uh, a lot of times it's very difficult to make those instant decisions. But what you see is, is the instant decision that that person on the ground that's in the middle of it uh, has to do. And it is a very, very awesome and very daunting task. You know, I tell my students all the time when they're covering things like breaking news, you have to really feel the effects of what you're doing. I can remember the first bank robbery that I covered, and my students just close your ears because you've heard it before. <laughs> but it's difficult when you're in the middle of covering something like that. You've got to think about, you know, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? People are emotional. And you've got to cover those stories with heart. And I'm so glad to be at a Christian university because I have the wherewithal not only to show you how to write it, to show you how to take that microphone and speak it, but and to show you how to actually do a package. But I can show you how to do that with heart. And that's difficult. And that's putting yourself in that person's position. But when I was covering that bank robbery, i had been asking for breaking news, for the top story. But I was the, at that time, I was the youngest person in the news department, and I never got it. That information, that crawl about covering that bank robber came over the scanner, and he said, and at that time I was Hayes, he said, okay, Elaine Hayes, it's yours. You got top story today. And I said, well, what's the story? He said, you just heard the bank robbery story. I said, you want me to cover that? And he said, well, yeah, it's, it's in Clinton. It's top story, and I want you to cover it. He's, I said, but the robber's still at the bank. <laughs> and he said, well, you need to get your reporter's notebook. And he threw me the keys to the car. He said, the camera's in the car, now go. All right? That was almost test by fire. And when I got on the interstate, I was going about 35. I want to make sure that robber is gone. <laughs> and I'm going this way, and I'm going that way. And... The highway patrol came behind me and said, uh, I was working for Channel 12 at the time, said, Channel 12, move ahead. We know where you're going. Well, I didn't really want to because I wanted that dangerous person to be out of there. But breaking news happens in where? A second. And then you've got to be on your way. All right, you determine how your coverage can inform and alert the public. You know, another thing that scripture says, it talks about leadership, but it talks about servant leaders, okay? In the news business, we are supposed to be servant leaders. 
We are here to disseminate information to the electorate so that you can make informed decisions. We're not here to slant it to the left. We're not here to slant it to the right. Although, without you telling me, that's done. And I tell my students the truth every day. But that is not our mission. Our mission is to tell you the truth and allow you to make up your own mind about the situation. Anchors and reporters should remain calm. And one of the great lessons from 9-11, and I'm sure you remember that, that coverage, is that the public trusted the information they received, at least in part because of the reassuring manner in which the information was reported during the crisis. Just think, Hurricane Katrina, who did you trust? There were members of the media. 9-11, who did you trust? All right, my scripture comes from, uh, one of them comes from Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Breaking news comes most of the time when it's what? When it's negative. That's what we see, unfortunately. But what I am seeing from at least our daily newspaper is a change in that front page. And I think that change is wonderful because you're giving us an opportunity to see other news that isn't what? Crime related. And I have enjoyed that. And I told the uh, David, the executive editor, before we left, I think that uh, he will go down in history as making a good and positive change so that we're not always opening up our newspapers or going online and seeing crime every minute of the day. Another scripture that I think that really applies to the media is Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. We are here to talk about the breaking news, which unfortunately is the negative news. But I think what we need to have is an expectation and not be ashamed to give the media that expectation that we want to hear some of the good things that are going on in our community. It means a lot. It helps us in terms of where we are with our children and where we're going from here. Now, I want to give you, you probably remember some of these uh, breaking news stories, but I want to see if you remember just a few. Dr. McCormick, I keep thinking about something that you talked about, I think it was on the broadcast last night, that when you were in the field, in very difficult, difficult circumstances, in not a fancy hospital, but in the field, taking blood from Ebola patients on the floor and, you know, in dark conditions without much light, you often didn't have the, the most high-tech protective gear. And that, it's, it's not about necessarily the, the highest level of technology, it's about protocols and rigorous adherence to them. Absolutely, that you cannot replace uh, human activity with technology, and if we try to do that, we're going to fail. Uh, I totally agree with the nurse, and, and furthermore, I would say, in the process of training, not only do they have to be trained regularly, and there should be a specific team that gets trained, uh, but they have to take ownership of the protocol. You have to sit down and talk with the nurses, because they're going to give the primary care, and they have to actually have to take ownership of the protocol if you want them to really feel as though they are the ones who are driving the care and are the ones who, they're gonna, they're gonna feel safe when they do that. If they don't do that, then, uh, then they're not gonna feel safe. I had a discussion today, I, I had another interview with some people down in South Texas, and there the hospital, uh, uh, the nurses were saying, well, our training consists of a YouTube uh, uh, just a, uh, a YouTube video of after training. Yeah, so they had no, no training, no, no repetitive training, 
and they had no input into uh, the, the uh, training itself. It's, uh, it's, it's truly stunning. Uh, Dr. McCormick, I appreciate you being on. I would love to talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more, but you know, what are we hearing in the media today? It's about Ebola. And we're trying to uh, make some, some sense of it. And, and when, we, when we work on this as journalists, do we have to know what the scientific research is about Ebola? We do, because we have to explain it to you. And so we tell our students, we have to know a little bit about just about what? Everything. So we're, we're trying to disseminate this to say, uh, you know, what's the scientific research out there? Is it what? Is it, is it uh, what are the protocols? What do the protocols mean? And, and everything that evolves around it. So uh, it's an awesome task for us to be with the microphone and for us to be talking to other people and trying to get you to see exactly what that's all about. So we have to be clear on what the subject matter is, but we also have to be clear as we disseminate that information to you. Okay. Here is another example. Did I skip it? 16? But the human element 
sometimes comes out, and that was my first report. And I'm just a sucker for, for children. I am just a sucker for children. Okay. Straight to this breaking news now, we have a crew on the scene of a homicide here in Jackson. JPD detectives are working the case in the 300 block of Sawani Drive. Authorities say the victim is a 32-year-old man. He had been shot multiple times. They are not releasing his name. At this time, investigators believe he was shot last night, but the victim was not discovered until today. Be sure to stay with us here on WLBT for the latest details. Now that was a breaking news story, and if I was sent to cover that particular story, it'd be very difficult for me. Because when I found out about the young man that was killed, I had worked with his mother years ago, and we were very close friends. But no matter what the story is, if I had been sent, would I have had to do that job? Yes, yes I would. So it gets to be difficult because we're human too. Breaking news, a man's body is found at a home near Capitol Street and police want answers. They responded to a call on 20th Street in West Jackson this afternoon. They're investigating this incident as a homicide and that's where we find News Channel 12's Danielle Vittable right now with the latest. Danielle. Police are still searching for answers after a man was found dead inside this house on Swanee Drive this afternoon. Authorities tell me he was found with multiple gunshot wounds and police tell Police say they think it happened last night. Now, this is the scene right now. Police are still out here interviewing witnesses and people around the area. But earlier today, just a couple hours ago, there was heavily populated with tons of police cars, crime scene units. Police tell me they got a call around 2 o'clock this afternoon when they came out to this house in the 300 block of Swanee Drive. They found a 33-year-old man in the back of the house. Police say he lived here with another woman. And even though police say it looked like it happened last night, a neighbor who doesn't want to be identified tells me he didn't hear any gunshots last night or this morning. I don't think it happened while I was over here. I think wherever he got shot had to be in a different location than in this area because we didn't do anything. We were up till 11 o'clock. And this investigation makes it the 56th homicide in Jackson this year. Tonight at 6 on News Channel 12, hear how neighbors describe the area. In Heights County, Danielle Vittable, News Channel 12. Same story. Thanks for joining us. It is the 56th different. homicide of the year. Thank you. It was handled how? Differently. Did you see all the tape around there? When it's breaking news, you're not supposed to go what? Under the tape. My students are laughing because I did that when I covered my first story. But, you know, I did not know at the time. But that means that that's not for anybody else but police to go over. All right, the internet uh, makes it possible for people other than traditional journalists to express themselves quickly to potentially large audiences. You know, I remember when I came to Bell Haven in 1998. That's what, 16 years ago. All right, uh, and I started a process whereby I wanted to get my students reading and watching newscasts and listening to talk radio because that's just what we do. And I thought I would give a current events quiz every day to ensure that they were doing what? Just that. When I walked into my classroom for the first time back in 1998, there were newspapers hitting me in the face because my students were reading and trying to pass these quizzes. When I walk in every Friday morning at 9 o'clock, no newspaper hits me in the face anymore. You know why? Because it's all technology. And when I walk in, I'm getting ready and setting up my PowerPoint. They go on to Cybergate, and they take their what? They take their quiz. And then when they step outside the door at 10, they can look on the computer and see what they made. How about that? <laughs> That's technology. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> All right? Uh, so the internet has done a whole lot for us. Uh, this is huge. And, and, and another thing, why do you want to know now? Do you know why we have breaking news? You don't want to wait. See, years ago, some people might remember this. 
We were just content to wait on the news. Mm -hmm. We waited until it was noon, and then we waited till five. We waited until six, and we waited until 10, like good boys and girls. <laughs> that doesn't happen anymore. If it happens now, when do you want to know about it? You want to know about it now. So that's something that, you know, we may complain about seeing this breaking news, but this is where we are. So what we've got to do, and what we've got to do as journalism educators, is to train our students to deal with breaking news just as they would if they had all the time in the world. And they don't have all the time in the world. Okay. All right, digital content media, which is, you know, when you've got apps on your phone and you're plugged into all of these stations, and I was happy to see digital content media become a reality because you know it's another job for my students. For the first time, I have a student who did an internship in digital content media uh, for the NBC affiliate right here. She's hiding behind the camera, but raise your hand, Morgan. Uh, she did a lot of writing for digital content. And she did a, a wonderful job. Now I've got a student uh, who, is, who will be graduating in May, and she will be my first digital content specialist. The digital content specialists work right hand in hand with news departments. They work hand in hand with the news reporters. And then they come together because do you see only the written word on your phone? You can see videos on your phone, can't you? Well, what they do, they will get videos as an event is happening and stream it on their what, particular app or their website. And you get an opportunity to see it then. And then if you want more details, what do you do? You go to the newscast, but it drives you to the newscast. Well, now, since with that position, that's another job for my students, and I'm sorry, I'm interested in them getting jobs. Not only just matriculating, but matriculating and then going to work. So now that adds another, what, job to the list. All right, so you're just one mouse click away uh, from stumbling onto content. But one thing I did want to mention when you talk about content, did you know that you're all publishers? We are, because we, how many of you have ever read a blog before? That's a publisher, okay. uh, Through social media, you know, we're, we're putting things and posting things everywhere, and we're being naughty because we're posting things we don't have any what? Business posting, yes, I said it. We don't have any business, but we do all of those things. And my students are tweeting from this event right now. So as this lecture is going on, people are hearing about exactly what's being said. They may be taking pictures of you and posting it. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. But that's just kind of the way it's done. But they are sharing this information about what's happening at Belhaven University. And uh, we're pleased about it. Who creates uh, uh, digital content? Uh, a consultant says all these areas of digital content. We mentioned tweeting, but Facebook, uh, photos, videos, blogs, audio, fi audio files, games, ebooks, and the list just goes what? It goes on and on. All of this is content. So it's changed the way that journalists cover news because you're getting some of that information from people who don't have the title of journalists. But you're getting information from them. So we've had, as journalism people, we've had to kind of tweak the way, the way that we can so that we can make sure that you're getting it where? <clears throat> from us. Because there's so much competition out there. Some of the competition is legitimate competition, and some of the competition isn't good at all because the information is not valid information. Now, in terms of traditional journalism, where we are now is that we're doing things differently. You know, years ago, 
we were in the process of always making sure that as journalists, we were driving the bus. We're not driving the bus anymore. We are kind of following. And we are trying to find our what? Our place in all of this. Because what did we have to do? We had to make some adjustments because uh, it was not business as usual. I took some students to a television station. I believe it was that last Friday. And the general manager told us, we're still getting about 94% of our information from television. And we're getting 6% of it from digital and internet. And you might say, well, that's not significant. It is. Last year, we were getting 4% from internet. This year, we're getting what? 6%. Now, what does that tell you? It's what? Increasing. It's increasing. It's growing and growing. And we have got to do what? We have got to stay up with the times and we have got to work with our students so that we get them involved with the tweeting and the Facebook and the, and the whole nine yards. And we had an interesting discussion uh, today, I believe it was, when we were talking about uh, Facebook. You know, when they're posting on Facebook, and you know, I had them kind of chuckling because uh, we need to be careful about what we post. I'm getting ready to go to the grocery store. Why do you need to post that on Facebook? I'm leaving for a two week vacation in Hawaii, and I am so excited. Tyrone, that, that, that really doesn't help you, does it? As a police officer, that's one of my, my students right there. It doesn't help you, does it? Because what have you done? <laughs> and the thieves just walked right in, but you posted. And do you know what? Sometimes we post, and we don't think anybody else that may not be of what? But may be of a criminal sort is doing what? They're reading the same post. So we've got to take all of this under consideration when we're getting ready. Uh, to do our jobs, but we've got all of this competition out there because, uh, you know, my students tell me, but people actually want to know this stuff. You know, I had a great day today. <laughs> I have decided that I'm not going to shop at North Park, I'm going to Dalton. <laughs> and uh, we say a lot of things when we post. That's very, very personal information. All right, I want you to think about this question. Where did you go to get your breaking news? Uh, you go where? Most of you go to television. What about digital content? Does anybody go there? Yes. And then social media? Yes. A little. See, so. All of these areas are still growing, and I don't want to send the message that television is on its way out. It's not, because what are we doing? We're reconfiguring what? How we make that assessment in television. And guess what? Television is a business. It's there to make, is, can I say it, Dr. Watts? It's there to make money. So since I got permission to say it, what have we got to do? We've got to reposition ourselves so that these young people here can get out and work in the business and make what? Make dollars. You know, I don't always, I don't just only teach my students and be an administrator for my department, but I help them secure jobs. I've got half of the graduating seniors in the program have already been hired. Okay. I've got one that has gone through an interview, and we're just waiting to hear what's going to happen with her interview. I've got one that we're working with. I think when you matriculate for four years, that's what you should do. You should be able to go out and work and work in your field. All of our students are mandated to do internships. Okay. And a lot of times when you do a good job on an internship, employers want to kind of keep you around, don't they? They want to keep you when somebody's doing well. 
I don't know where Sarah or when I can't see her. Okay. She did a good job on the internship, and if funds had been available, her supervisor would have what? Would have hired her. And we're and that's what we try to do. And I try to network as best I can to try to help students to do what it, whatever it is that they want to do in the field of communication. Now, where did you receive your information about Ebola when you first heard it? Television. It was television. What about ISIS, the conflict? Television. television. And what about these horrible school shootings? Television. Now, all of you said television, but I don't hear my students' voices because they got it here. <laughs> they didn't get it, did you? They didn't get it from television. You know? And, you know, and they have me pulled in a lot of directions. When I get up first thing in the morning, I gotta have what? I gotta have a good dose of that newspaper. I want to smell, I want the newsprint on my hand. I want it on my hand. Then, when I get to the office, you know, by the time uh, David Hampton's coming out of his class, I'm online, and I don't go back to the newspaper. But in the, in the morning time, I've got to have that dose of newsprint. And pretty soon, it's probably going to all be what? And we've got to teach our students how to handle themselves when they're dealing with it online. All right, now, we kind of know what breaking news is all about. But you know, here in Belhaven, we always break it down to the scriptures. You know, I grew up in a household where Job was the favorite book of the Bible, wasn't it? It was the favorite book of the Bible. Mom could quote it from the beginning to the end. But when I think about Job, and I think about breaking news, it all kind of comes together for me. Because will breaking news be here forever? And it seemed like Job was going through what forever? His trials and tribulations. They lasted forever. But then at the, at the end, God did what for Job? He restored him. Okay? Now, we have to cover the breaking news and, and the bad stuff. But is it a way that the media can restore the community? You can restore the community. Because you can do what? You can publish, and print, or broadcast some really good things. Because just like, you know, I hear people talking all the time and I talk to my, my guys, I've got, I don't know how I was so fortunate to have so many police officers in a class that I'm teaching, but we talk about crime in Jackson. And we talk about what we need to do about it. But on the other side, are there some good things happening in this community? There are some wonderful things happening that we need to find a way to tell that story just as much as we're telling a story about what's happening here. So the newsroom must be a place of integrity, faith, and honesty. We're all looking at the bottom line. We must bear witness as servant leaders as Job did as he transformed to a new person. Now, the news is different today. Just like Job was different after he had gone through those trials and tribulations and lost one family, but God restored him to having what? A brand new family. What we've got to know is that breaking news, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, won't go anywhere anytime soon. So with breaking news, we have got to look at what? How we cover that and how we assess what we are doing. Is it a tough task? It is. But I think I've got the talent here. I know at this university, I don't know about other universities, I think we can get that job done. But it's got to be a conscientious effort on our part because there's so much bad stuff out there. It's huge. So we've got to kind of deal with that. All right. Job remained, what, faithful to God's teaching? And as Christian journalists, we must remain steadfast in our journey to disseminate information to the electorate 
that is not biased or slanted in any way. It's kind of interesting that when we start talking about different networks and newspapers and everything, uh, my students can say, but Dr. Anthony, I think they do this, or I think they do that. And I think that's a good thing, that they can recognize that. But the point that I want them to recognize is get out there and do a fair and, and unbiased job with integrity. And always, always tell the truth. And believe it or not, do you know that people will make a decision, and a good decision, but they need good what? Facts. They've got to have good information. If they don't, they can't do it. So the different platforms used for breaking news make it easier and more convenient to capture information in instantly. As we scramble through chaos, and sometimes it is chaos. You know, when you're in the middle of something, and everything is going on around you, and I tell my students, you've got to have what? You've got to have an eye. Well, maybe I need to interview this person. Maybe I need to interview that person. <clears throat> you know, you don't just grab the first. It should be something about that person that made you interview. You know, and I can, I can remember with great care uh, how, how people used to make that assessment of who to interview. You know, sometimes it could take you two hours to get a good subject. Because you want somebody that's going to have what? Something to say. I can remember coming back to the newsroom. Well, where have you been all this time? Well, I was trying to find a good subject. I wanted somebody that was going to impart some information and not just say what? Anything. So that's a, a thing that we need to do. All right, so with this chaos, the, uh, and, and it's the inevitable, uh, we must be like Job in maintaining the basic tenets of what? Traditional journalism. What did Job maintain? His, his, his what? His faith. We have to maintain what in journalism? Integrity. We have got to maintain that integrity so people will want to put, to, to watch us, they will want to listen to us, they will want to read about us, and all of this technology that, that we're talking about, that will come to bear. But those basic tenets in Job, that transformation, they won't change. People will always turn to you for information when you what? When you are telling the truth, you will always be there for that. Now, I mentioned earlier about my Christian walk and, and what it is that, that I believe in. And I've told you in some phases of this report, I am a believer. And I'm glad to work at a university that recognizes believers. And I can openly talk about my belief and I can pray in my classes. That means a lot to me. I hope it means a lot to our students here at Bell Haven. But in terms of my Christian walk as a journalist, I believe that I'm going to always get the facts. I'm not going to say that the human element will not come out. As it relates to children, I, I have a problem with people mistreating children because they don't have the ability to do what? To stick up for themselves. I, I have a problem with that. So I guess I'll be reprimanded on that all the time. But my Christian walk says that I'm going to be a person of faith. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to get those facts straight. You know, and I'm going to do a good job. I teach my students that the clock on the wall to a journalist means nothing. If you got one more telephone call to make, you need to make it. If you need to make one more assessment or look at one more document before it's published or before it's broadcast, you need to make it. So my Christian walk is to make sure that I understand the technology, that I work within the technology, and that I always, always tell the truth about whatever it is. You need to know that in our business, it's not going to always be pretty. 
We're not a business of, of what? Of, of feature stories. We do a few. But a lot of the stories that we do are hard news. And sometimes in, de in delivering hard news, you have to say some bad things. You have to report on some things that are not pleasant. But it needs to be reported. People have a right to what? Know. And it's our jobs, and I call us watchdogs. We are watchdogs for you. Because I don't know about you, but at 9 o'clock in the morning, I've got to be at Bell Haven University teaching on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I can't be out of the community. I can't be at the legislature. I can't be in government offices. So I am depending upon a respected media with integrity to tell me what is going on. Because I can't be there. I've got to be with these wonderful students. And we have a job on our hands. So I hope that we are disseminating information that will definitely be for the betterment of the students that we serve. And it is definitely a service. All right, I want, I'm going to ask the, my, you know, he is my uh, adjunct professor, but I'm so proud he's my former student. <laughs> We did a little, we went out in the city and did some. As you can see, breaking news happens at government officials' offices. Here at the Jackson Police Department and our criminal justice system, breaking news happens every day. I'm located right here in downtown Jackson. The street here looks relatively deserted. But when there's breaking news, we only have a few minutes to jot some notes down, maybe on a cell phone, but we have to be able to report accurately to the public what's going on in our surroundings. Breaking news is something that happens every day. Breaking news is something that is also here to stay. Breaking news is here to stay. But we must remember elements of breaking news, which would be fairness and accuracy. That's what we want, and that's what we teach here at Bell Haven University. We want our students to understand that it only takes one story to either make a career or break a career. We want them to know how to couch it and what it takes to be able to think clearly and to be able to give the public that we serve what they need to make concrete, accurate decisions for their daily lives. Elaine Anthony, Bellhaven News. All right, I want to also thank uh, my adjunct professor, Don Spann, for hanging out with me at odd hours to kind of bring some of this uh, together. And I want to thank the Bellhaven University family, our president, Dr. Roger Parrott, and our uh, executive uh, vice president and provost, Dr. Dan Fredericks, and Dr. Dennis Watts, of whom you just met. And I want to thank my students. If they would just stand, my current and former students, if any are here, would you please stand up? Thank you very, very much, Dr. Barnes. <laughs> On behalf of the Mississippi Humanities Council, I would like to present you with a $300 check. <laughs> There will be a dinner honoring her and the other um, awardees February 13th at the Old Capitol Museum. I assume anybody can buy tickets, is that correct? Anybody? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if you want to buy a ticket, to go join them for dinner. Um, there is a reception out there that will follow. And let me close this with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that you have gifted uh, Elaine with the uh, ability to teach students, to um, impart wisdom to them. We pray that you would continue to bless her service here at Bellhaven 
and that you would be using her to raise up the next generation of journalists who are willing not only to show the degradation of society, but they're also willing to show the redemption of society. That people would be turned to you even as they um, see how you can redeem. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much. And thank you all for, for uh, coming. I really appreciate it and seeing so many people here that I know and respect and love that you took the time out of your, your day to actually come out and uh, be with me. It means a very, very, it means a lot to me to see my friends that I know and that I love so much. So thank you very, very much. Come on up here, honey. <laughs> this is the shot. This is my rock. This is who I, I look to for a lot of wisdom. When I'm going through some things, and I just wanted to publicly say thank you, and thank you, Ricky, and thank you, Gloria. I really appreciate uh, these gorgeous flowers, and I really appreciate you. Aww.